Hello everybody, welcome back to another exciting edition of Ed Puzzle Video Lecture Notes. Today we're going to continue on through the reproductive system and specifically the male anatomy in the reproductive system. And first we're going to talk about the negative feedback system when it comes to the male hormone testosterone. So that's the hormone that gives males their secondary characteristics like a deeper voice, greater muscle growth, facial hair, things like that. Obviously, this stuff begins at puberty. So that's when the males start to begin producing their testosterone. And it all begins in that master part of the, the brain, the hypothalamus. And it releases a hormone called GNRH, which is gonadotropin-releasing hormone. And that hormone, remember the hypothalamus is always directly tied to the master gland, the pituitary gland, and that causes the release of GnRH or gonadotropin releasing hormone, causes the anterior pituitary, anterior means the front part of the pituitary, to release LH or luteinizing hormone, and it also releases FSH or follicle stimulating hormone. So that is first began in the hypothalamus with the release of GnRH, and that stimulates the anterior pituitary. Now, it is this luteinizing hormone, LH, which stimulates, and write this down, the Leydig cells to begin secreting the male hormone, testosterone. Now, it is the follicle-stimulating hormone and testosterone, which stimulates spermatogenesis, which is basically just the production of sperm. Now, that is what stimulates sperm production. But there's also Sertoli cells, which secrete a hormone called inhibin, which slows spermatogenesis when they're at required levels. And also, so this, it's a negative feedback loop, so this hormone inhibin goes back and inhibits the hypothalamus from releasing GnRH, or gonadotropin-releasing hormone, and also the increase in testosterone also does the same thing. It says, hey, we got enough of this hormone, we got enough spermatogenesis going on, and that increase in testosterone also inhibits the release of GnRH. So it's, it's a negative feedback. So once those hormones become high in the body, it tells the hypothalamus, okay, let's start slowing down the release of gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which slows down the whole process. All right, so here's a little diagram that basically just shows you what I just talked about. So it all starts with the hypothalamus in the, in the brain releasing GnRH or gonadotropin releasing hormone that stimulates the anterior pituitary, the front part of the pituitary, to release both the hormones, LH, luteinizing hormone, and FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. And that stimulates the Leydig cells to produce testosterone. And it's testosterone which facilitates or speeds up the spermatogenesis, the production of sperm. But you can also see that the testosterone has a negative effect on the hypothalamus and also a negative effect on the anterior pituitary. So once, and also the inhibin also has a, a negative effect to stop the hypothalamus from releasing GnRH, and it also stops the anterior pituitary from releasing LH and FSH. And just in case you didn't get it for the, from the first two slides, here's another slide that says kind of the same stuff. So if sperm production is sufficient, so like there's enough sperm being produced, the Sertoli cells release that hormone inhibin, which slows or stops the secretion of follicle-stimulating hormone by the anterior pituitary, which will decrease sperm production. Now, if sperm production is going too slowly, it'll have the opposite effect. Less inhibin will be secreted, and this will cause more follicle-stimulating hormone to be secreted, which will increase the rate of spermatogenesis, or production of sperm. And here's just some hormonal effects of testosterone. I'm just going to go over some of these. You're not going to need to know all this. So, I mean, it obviously, it stimulates male reproductive development prior to that male being born. This DHT, this dihydrotestosterone, helps to develop the external 
male genitalia. Uh, it stimulates testicular descent, which means the males, their testicles actually come out of their body around the seventh month. I highly doubt you're going to have to remember the seventh month. It also gives males what's called their secondary sexual characteristics. So this will kind of be important. But like chest hair, bone and muscle growth, which will be more pronounced in males than in females. The wide shoulders and narrow hips, which you don't usually see in, in females. The deepening of the, of the voice, thick skin, oil gland, oil gland secretion, etc. Stimulates protein synthesis, which gives you that heavier bone and muscle mass. And testosterone is very important in the male sex drive, also called their libido. All right, so this slide is going to show you the pathway that sperm travels through, through the male reproductive system, as it goes from the beginning, the actual production of new sperm cells, to when it actually is ejaculated or, or is exited from the body. So this process is going to begin in the seminiferous tubules. This is where meiosis actually occurs. So this is where the spermatogenic cells actually differentiate to become unique individual sperm cells through the process of meiosis. So after meiosis occurs in the seminiferous tubules and you have sperm cells, those cells will now move on to the epididymis. And this is where the sperm will actually, so you can see these tubules right here, that's the epididymis, and it travels all the way through here. That's where the sperm is actually going to mature. After it leaves the epididymis, it's going to enter what's called the vas deferens. You can see that right here. This is where it's going to, it's going to leave the testicles through the vas deferens. Then, not pictured here, but it's going to enter what's called the ejaculatory ducts. Then it'll actually enter the hole in the penis called the urethra. And then finally, it is exited out of the body through the external urethral orifice. All right, so now we're quickly going to go over these ducts or tubes within the male reproductive system. And this is going to be the epididymis. That's a comma-shaped organ. It's about an inch and a half long on the posterior or back border of each testes in the male anatomy. Now, if you remember back from our summer assignment, summer of 2019, it's lined with pseudostratified cells. Now, stratified means that there's stacks. There's stacks of cells on top of each other. Simple means it's a, a, one line of cells. Pseudostratified means it looks like it's a stack of cells, but it's really only a single line of cells. And it's ciliated, so it means it contains cilia, those little hair-like structures that can move, move the fluids along. They're columnar, so they're not flat like squamous cells. They're, they're more like columnar, like, like this rectangle over here. And they're smooth muscle, remember, so it's not skeletal muscle, so these are things that are outside of your voluntary control. Now, as you can see, if you uncoiled that entire tube of the epidi epididymis, it would be about 20 feet long. And this is the site of sperm maturation. So it's going to store the sperm for one to two months. Now, if it doesn't, if the sperm doesn't get ejaculated or removed from the body within around 70 days, those sperm cells are actually going to be reabsorbed. They're going to be broken down and reabsorbed in the body. Now, if it is not reabsorbed, it will be expelled through the body, th uh, outside the body through ejaculation. So motility or movement is going to increase over a two-week period, so the sperm are going to become more mobile. They'll be able to m move more. So that's the epididymis. Now, following the epididymis, you have what's called the vas deferens, ductus vas deferens, which is roughly about an 18-inch muscular tube that goes from the epididymis through the spermatic cord. Now the vas deferens ascends along the posterior or back border of the epididymis. It reaches the posterior or back surface of the urinary bladder, and it's going to dump its product in what's called the pro prostatic urethra, which is also where the seminal vesicles are going to release their product. It's going to store sperm for up to two months, three months actually, and it's going to propel the sperm toward the urethra via peristaltic contractions. So from the digestive system, remember, 
Peristalsis is like rhythm-like muscle contractions which move fluids along, and this is exactly how the sperm is going to be moved along through the ductus vas deferens. All right, now the ejaculatory ducts, which are right here. And you can see the prostate gland, which is right there. Basically, the ejaculatory ducts is where the vas deferens, the ampulla of the vas deferens, and the seminal vesicle duct, they merge. So they merge right there into the ejaculatory duct. So that's where a lot of excess fluids are added to the sperm to form semen. And that's basically all you need to know about the ejaculatory ducts. And now the spermatic cord. I wouldn't spend too much time studying this because I don't remember this being on our test at all. But it's like a cord-like structure which all the structures passing to and from the testes, they go through the spermatic cord. Uh, so obviously the testicular artery. Uh, it's what's called the pampiniform plexus of veins, like a big cluster of veins. Uh, what you really need to know is the cremaster muscle and the ductus or vas deferens. Those two pass through the spermatic cord and we'll believe we'll go over the cremaster muscle here in a little bit or maybe we went over it last time, I can't remember. But that is the muscle that will either constrict, which will bring the testicles closer to the body if it is too cold and it'll relax and let the, the testicles hang down lower when it is too warm because to produce sperm they need a temperature that's lower than the 98.6 so usually it uh, is beneficial for the testicles to, to hang down a little lower to increase sperm production and here is the technique the male sterilization technique it's called a vas vasectomy and that is where the vas deferens is cut and tied off so you can see it right here the vas deferens is cut so it does not allow any sperm to be released from the body Remember, now that sperm is still being, its production still continues, but the sperm is actually reabsorbed in the body so those nutrients can be used again. Uh, it's 100% effective, so it does work. But if you want to change your mind and say, hey, whoops, I, I really didn't mean to do that, eh, it's only about 40% re reversible, so probably don't want to do it unless you're sure. All right, really quickly, the inguinal ca canals, remember, inguinal means the groin. So the inguinal canals, there are two passageways right here, which contain the spermatic cords. And the, this is a common place where hernias, I'm not going to really go over indirect or direct hernia because I don't even think you're going to need to know hernia, for, you know, much less the difference between the two. But that's where either a part of your small intestine or some fatty tissue can actually break through the front of the abdominal wall. Now it's painful, you really can't lift weights for a while, but can be uh, easily cured with, with a surgery. Very common in males especially. All right, so now it's time for our daily riddle. The riddle of the day is what three letters can be used as an immediate source of energy and can also be used to sleep in when you're camping. Think about that for a second. And the answer, of course, is ATP. All right, so next we have the urethra. I'm gonna go really quick because this is getting kind of long, so just what you need to know. It's the eight inch long passageway, and it's not exactly eight inches, but, and that's where the urine and semen travel through the penis. You're not gonna need to know the difference between, you know, the spongiosum and the cavernosum, so I'm not gonna really go over that, but feel free to write it if you'd like. And now you have some accessory sex glands in the male anatomy. Right here you have the prostate gland right there. And also you have the bulbo urethral or the cowper's gland located right there. But 
the main thing you need to know, remember, you're going to have to be able to trace the path of the sperm through the male anatomy. Remember, it's going to start in the seminiferous tubules in the testes. It'll then go through the epididymis. It'll then go through the vas deferens. It'll then reach the ejaculatory duct. And then finally, out and through the urethra. So that's the path that it's going to take the sperm through the male anatomy. Another accessory structure in the male anatomy, this is the seminal vesicles. You can see it right here. And another right here, just posterior, so behind the urinary bladder. So this is not going to be easy to remember, so these are things you're going to have to study. It releases a fluid that is both alkaline, which means it has a basic pH, which is above 7. 7 is neutral. Below 7 is acidic. Above 7 is basic or alkaline. And it's also viscous, which means it's kind of thick. So it's not real thin or runny. Uh, it neutralizes vaginal acid. You won't need to know that. You probably need to know this. It produces, it releases fructose, which is important in ATP production. Now from our daily riddle, you know that ATP is used for energy. It's a molecule that can be used as, as an immediate source of energy. Um, and you won't need to know exact, but it's about 60% of, a, of the volume of semen, the, the products of the seminal vesicles. Another ex accessory structure is the prostate gland, which is located right here. Also, this is a posterior view, so it's inferior and slightly posterior to the urinary bladder. And its secretions are milky and is slightly acidic. Remember, 7 is neutral, so 6.5 would be slightly acidic. It contains citric acid, which is important for the production of ATP. If you remember our daily riddle, ATP is a molecule that can be used as an immediate source of energy. Its products make up about 25% of semen in volume. And the prostate enlarges with age. And males, kind of like females, have to check for breast cancer. Males have to check for prostate cancer because this is kind of a common type of cancer in males. And the last accessory structure in the male anatomy is the bulbourethral or Cowper's glands. They're located right there, inferior to the prostate and to the urinary bladder. Their secretions is alkaline, so it has a pH greater than 7. 7 is neutral, below 7 would be acidic. And it helps to neutralize the acids that are still present in the urethra from urine, because urine has an acidic pH, so it helps to neutralize that acidic pH, and also helps to lubricate the distal end of the urethra within the penis. And now you have semen, which is what is released during sexual arousal, which is a mixture of both sperm and seminal fluid. It is slightly alkaline or basic. So it's pH, I, I believe this should say 7.2 to 7.77 pH, which makes it basic or alkaline. You're not going to need to know that, 7.2 to 7.77. Uh, contains nutrients, clotting proteins, and some natural antibiotics. A typical ejaculate contains about 2.5 to 5 milliliters in volume. Highly doubt you'll need to know that. And in that, a typical ejaculate will contain about 300 million sperm cells. Once again, I highly doubt you'll have to remember that exact number. So the normal sperm count would be about 50 to 150 million per milliliter. Uh, so if you have less than 20 million per milliliter, that would be considered a low sperm count. Doesn't mean you can't have kids, but you'd have a much less chance of uh, fertilizing the egg with a low sperm count. You won't need to know that much about semen, so I'm going to leave it right there. And the anatomy of the penis. You have what's called the root, is where, where it attaches to the body. Then you have the body, which makes up the bulk 
of its mass. And then you have the glands, which is the distal end right here. And then you have the prepuce, which is the foreskin, which will cover the gland for males that are uncircumcised. And of course, this serves as a passageway for both semen and urine in the male anatomy. And now the very distal part of the penis is called the glans penis. And that's the very, very end down in here. It's an enlarged distal end of corpus spongiosum. So, not that this is going to be super important, but the spongiosum is right here, the very, the most deep portion. Then you have the, the uh, cavernosa, which is located more superficial on the outside. And like I said before, you have the prepuce, which is the foreskin, which covers the glans penis on uncircumcised males. And of, of course, the external urethra orifice is the opening at the end, which urine and semen will flow out. And now look at a cross section of a penis. So you have the corpora cavernosa, which makes up the bulk of the erectile tissue up here, which is superior to the corpus spongiosum, which is erectile tissue, the lower erectile tissue mass. The corpus spongiosum is what surrounds the urethra right there. The duct which semen and urine travel through. So both their erectile tissue. Other than that, you won't need to know much. So that should be about good for that. And the last slide of the male anatomy here in the reproductive system is the procedure called circumcision. And that is the removal of the prepuce or the foreskin around the glans penis in the male anatomy. Now why do they do it? Uh, in the US it's mainly considered for aesthetic purposes but it also could possibly lower your chance of getting a urinary tract infection, uh, some cancer and actually some evidence shows that it can give you a reduced chance of getting a sexually transmitted disease if you had unprotected sex. All right, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll talk to you next time.